Architecture for Geospatial Collaboration by system architect Ben Lewis of Harvard University. Um, this open source theme will be revisited and expanded on March 5th of next year, 2015, at our open source symposium at Will uh, Villanova University in Pennsylvania. Coming sooner, um, there will be a call for papers to present your projects during this year's MAGTUB GIS Day event at Burlington County College in New Jersey. Please watch your inboxes in the coming weeks for details. If you have any questions about anything I've just said or have suggestions for future webinar topics, please contact me through the MAGTUG Dot org website. That's Janelle Bisquino. I'm the first one in the list of the steering committee. Just click on me. Um, while you're at uh, the website, uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our email list and join the GIST discussion group. Now on with the webinar that, um, that has brought us here today. Uh, improving roadway safety by assessing MUTCD it will be presented by Bob Poliska. Mr. Poliska is a regional director of the JMT Technology Group. He works with clients to deliver business critical GIS and software application solutions. Mr. Poliska has 17 years of experience and holds a Master's of Science in Geographic Information Systems, a Bachelor of Science in Forest Science, a GIS professional certification and a project management professional certification from the Project Management Institute. <laughs> DMT Technology Group is a progressive geospatial and information technology services provider that assists a variety of industries to solve complex business challenges through the use of web, desktop, and mobile technologies. Their industry experience allows their clients to receive more immediate and measurable return on investment through their ability to facilitate a proven collaborative process that ensures the best solution for each unique challenge. Bob, you can introduce your co-presenter and take it away. Great. Um, thank you, Janelle. Um, as Janelle mentioned, uh, my name is Bob Pliska. I'm the regional director for the uh, JMT Technology Group. Also on the phone, we have Lori Bowman, who is a who serves a lot of roles at the group. Uh, amongst uh, amongst them is she is a developer. She's also a application tester, tester and serves as business analyst in, in some many of our different projects. And she actually assisted on the application. We're going to we're going to talk through and, and show you a little bit of today. Um, so she, she will be available uh, in a supportive role if we have questions that come up um, uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, the way our, we're planning to do this is we're going to take you through uh, a slideshow and do a demonstration of an application we built in support of selecting sign inventory. And then um, if questions, if you have any questions, you, can, you should have a questions panel in your GoToMeeting uh, window where you can type them in and we'll work through them at the end. Um, this is set up as a go-to webinar, so, you, so all listeners are going to be muted uh, automatically. And um, you know, we'll have to kind of, I'll field your questions, whatever's typed in there, and, and try to address them at the end of the, at the, end of the webinar. So if, if you can't hear me, if you're having trouble seeing anything, please sh uh, chat or raise your hand. I should be able to do that in your go-to meeting window. If I don't see anything, then I'm going to assume everyone can hear and, and see us. So without further ado, um, we're going to talk about a project we are doing for Mercer County. It is a DVR PC funded project. Uh, we, JMT, are a sub to Taylor Wise and Taylor, an engineering firm out of uh, Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And the, the entire scope of the project is to do a, a comprehensive sign inventory on all the county maintained roads. Uh, before I get into the specifics of the projects, of the project itself, I know Janelle has mentioned, uh, bear with me one second here.
Janelle has introduced um, JMT. I'll take you real quick through a couple important bullets. Um, we are a geospatial techn technology service this is and solutions provider. We work in both the government and private sector markets, and we do a wide range of applications, from simple desktop applications, which um, is kind of what we're going to talk through today, to complex mobile or complex web-based applications. And, uh, and for example, if you're an outdoorsman and you're buying a hunting and fishing license in Maryland, you'll be using our system um, in the state of Maryland. And along with that, we have some key business partnerships that help us, that have helped us uh, armed us with the appropriate technology to to deliver these solutions, ESRI on base from a content management perspective, Microsoft and Oracle. So back to the project. So the main driver for this sign inventory, one, or should I, I should say one of the key drivers, is the Federal Highway Administration's uh, MUTCD, Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it defines standards for the road managers to maintain devices on the streets, high, public streets, highways, bikeways, private roads, pretty much anything open to the public. And within that manual, there's a certain section that talks about retroreflectivity, which is essentially a driver's ability to read that sign and safely understand what it's trying to tell them, whether it be stop or sharp curve ahead or right turn ahead. Um, there's some minimum values that are demonstrated in this excerpt from the manual. Now, you don't necessarily need to read it, but what it's showing is based on the different colors that may be existing in a sign, there's certain measured reflectivity values a sign needs, needs to return to be considered in compliance. So that was one of the key drivers of, of why this inventory needed to be created. Moving on. It also kind of walks through the acceptable methods to assess for retroreflectivity. There is the visual nighttime inspection method. And this is kind of just what it sounds like, right? This is having trained eyes driving down the road at night um, when headlights hit the sign, assessing where they, they think that's a pass or a fail in terms of reflectivity. And there's some training that has to go into play there, and there's certain weather conditions, certain vehicle types, and some of the parameters that are, that are part of that process. There's a measured sign retroreflectivity, which is kind of what it sounds like using some kind of device, whether it be a vehicle-mounted device or a handheld reflectometer to actually get some measurements um, that determine retroreflectivity. Expected sign life uh, essentially is when you install a sign. There's, a, there's an expected life, and after the, uh, that life has expired, you, you replace them. Blanket replacement, um, may, maybe a, a municipality or, or, or uh, a larger entity has a, um, a plan in place and every X amount of years they're going to replace their signs regardless of the sign life or the, what the retro uh, retroreflectivity values may be. Control signs, you might have a subset of signs. Um, you monitor them when they begin to fail. You, you re replace all the, let's say your control signs are for yield, you, you, you'd replace all the yield signs. Other methods, I don't think they go into a lot of detail there, but I think that's probably a case-by-case -case basis. So that's some of the, the, the real highlights of the retroreflectivity. There's certainly a lot more information in the manual. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple key things that were important as we, as we thought, thought through how we were going to approach this project. So the background. Um, the county had an existing sign inventory. Uh, we spent some time talking with them about it, um, looking, looking through the existing inventory um, we knew it was incomplete in some cases. In some cases, we thought it might require verification. In addition to that, we also knew that there was some, there was some key information that was going to need to be collected in this inventory. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had a barcode on each sign. That's kind of a means to unique, uniquely identify it and track where that sign is in its life. And, and if it gets knocked down, be able to identify you know, which sign, in fact, it was. Sign locations, XY coordinates, survey grade type stuff. Attributes for not only the sign, but the support, um, because we know supports can have multiple signs in some cases. Retro for reflectivity per the MUTCD. Photos with each sign, uh, multiple photos in many cases. Record uh, sign supports that may have missing signs. And, and also warning locations, 
if we come across a location where there's no sign and it feels like there should be some kind of regulatory or warning sign, we want to be able to record those locations and some attributes about them. Um, and then we kind of we came around to all agreeing that we wanted some kind of measured sign reflectivity as opposed to any kind of nighttime inspection. Now you'll see as I talk through this that there are some cases where we had to use the nighttime inspection method and that was really because of inaccessibility of a particular sign. Target locations, you can see here as they come up, um, they were prioritized by the county and we, we did our best to, to go after the ones that were the highest priority and gather the signs that were needed. But the scope we're talking about is county roads, parking lots, thoroughfares, municipal streets, and county bridges. And the last component was the available tools. Between us and, and Taylor Wiseman Taylor, we had a survey grade GPS unit available. We are, we are an Esri Silver partner, a Microsoft partner. Um, from a previous uh, asset inventory, we had a camera that connects to um, a laptop with a Wi-Fi connection. We had a convertible laptop that really can act as a field device and a, and a computer in, in a desktop environment. Um, that you will use every day to, to get your emails and do all your other stuff. And a reflectometer device. So based on these tools, we want to put together a solution that made sense. Um, certainly not force technology where it wasn't needed, um, but use what we had in place and, and develop an, a, an efficient way to not only inventory it, but to update the attributes going forward and, and kind of a simple way to do that. So before we did, we did that, we talked through how this data was going to be collected. Um, we knew it was going to be a large-scale collection. I think we're towards the end now, and we're talking about 10,000-plus signs that are going to be done. Um, we had two crews we're going to send out there. And basically, the agreed, how we kind of agreed upon a workflow is that we were going to have simple collection areas assigned to each of the two different crews. Um, you can manually do that using the GIS, dividing it up by uh, road segments. They're going to drive to a location, and they're going to collect all this information in, at one shot. And essentially, what they're going to be would be collecting are the attributes uh, associated with a sign or a support, the photos that might be linked to those signs or supports, uh, some mapping information, location, distance to the nearest intersection association with the nearest uh, roadway uh, feature, um, and then reflectivity. This is the reflectometer that was being used in the field that captures a couple measurements. It captures the reflectivity of the different legend and background colors. It actually is a barcode scanner, which was important because we were going to barcode each one of these signs. And it's uh, and also a survey grade GPS location. Now you'll see here, indicated by this blue box, what information is actually going to be captured on the laptop and what was going to be captured um, via, the survey, via the survey unit. And we did it this way because we have an approximate, or a planning level, I should say, GPS coordinate coming from the reflectometer that would put the sign close enough where we needed why we, to collect the attributes. And this would allow the survey grade, the survey folks to actually occupy the site for a while capture a GPS coordinate for the actual support survey level and then marry the two later on based on matching ID numbers. There's a QC component to both, actually obviously revisiting the field as needed if we came across issues with any of the attribute data, post-processing of the survey data, post-processing of the final inventory data. I'll touch on this a little bit later on, but essentially that's uh, linear referencing. We're going to assign a mile post to each sign support. We're going to run some QA, QC scripts to validate any issues. We have certainly got QA built into the application in terms of business rules and, and database domains, but just to make sure no editing was done outside the application that might have validated those rules, we'll, we'll run some scripts on the database. And we're also going to work on some degradation rates based on reflectivity today for sign using some degradation parameters. We'll, we'll try to forecast out when we think that sign might kick over and be non-compliant from a retro reflectivity perspective. 
So based on our workflow, we put together an application. Um, I'm going to walk through it in a little bit more detail in a minute or so here, but essentially it's a simple desktop application that's run on that Lenovo, can be taken into the field. Uh, we weren't doing any collection in any kind of adverse weather conditions, so it, it, it worked well for us that way. It is connected with the reflectometer or integrated, if you will, via the Bluetooth connection, uh, digital camera, which uh, is connected to the laptop via Wi-Fi and, and basically sends the pictures to a specific directory on the laptop. And then the application built some simple data entry forms and a mapping interface to, to capture the required information and any of the mapping information. Okay. The database, uh, for the purposes of managing the collection effort, we built an SDE, SDE geodatabase. Uh, eventually, it's going to be sent to uh, Mercer County as a personal geodatabase. But for the collection, we want to put an SDE uh, to have uh, managed versioning, check-in, check-outs. Inside the, uh, the database are a photos table, which essentially contains the links to the photos that are stored outside in, in a file directory. The sign table which is all the attributes associated with the signs linked to the sign support feature class, which actually has, has the GIS or the GPS locations stored in the uh, Esri GIS format uh, with all the associated attributes. We have the sign type data table. Uh, that's a, basically a lookup table that was built in, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through why that was really important and helpful in the field in, in, in a minute or two. And then the warranted signs. And essentially, this is where you may come across a situation where a sign is warranted. It um, is not there, but for a safety reason or some other reason, we thought it should be there. So we um, want to be able to drop a point and, and collect some attributes about that. Okay. So that was a, a quick overview. I'm going to now step through the application, some screenshots I want to talk through a little bit, and then I'll, and then I'll run through uh, a demonstration of some of the key workflows after this. All right, so highlights. Um, talked about this a little bit. It's Arc Engine application uh, designed for, in the use, for use in the field and the office. Um, it's not a mobile sense, a mobile application in the pure sense by any means. It's, like I said, it's developed kind of in that desktop environment. We want to record existing, missing, and the warranted signs. Uh, talked about the geo database being SDE version. Again, that was for the collection effort. And the integration with reflectometer via Bluetooth was important. Uh, it, it really helped speed things along up in, uh, when out in the field. Home screen, um, as you may see in, in many typical applications, uh, you have the ability to make sure you're connected to your Bluetooth um, real time that you can add signs, warranted signs, or missing signs, and that you can look at signs, warranted signs, and supports as a series of tabs over here in the bottom right. View, view your asset in the map at any point you want, and then some basic search parameters, as uh, you might typically see in an application. Sign collection. Um, we want to create a, a very easily navigable form. Uh, we did so by putting key sections on the left, upper left there that you can kind of click around and scroll through the form and, and collect specific attributes for your sign or your support. There was, on the bottom left, you can see there's certainly required fields that we highlighted. The application will not let you save unless they're collected. There's certain fields that the county knows they're going to want to fill in at some point, so we kind of mark those with the county symbol, so they're not necessarily required in the field, and, and the technicians or the field folks would know that and not need to spend too much time on those. The different sections, you can see retro reflectometer section, a section for sign data, a section for your support data, and then a section for the photos. Sign details. Uh, and I think you'll get a sense for, for the importance of this when I, when I walk through the application. But essentially, one of the first things in the workflow was for the technician to identify actually which type of sign they're looking at per MUTCD. There's quite a large number of categories and codes that were in the manual, I, I want to say it was two or 3,000, I could be wrong on that number, but it was a lot. So we built a, a lookup table that was linked, that had a photo of each different sign linked to it. So when a user went out to the field and typed in the word yield, 
the first one in the list would pop up and they'd be able to scroll through and actually look at a picture of the sign so they can say, yes, this is the sign I'm looking at. The height, the width dimensions automatically populate. Um, the MUTCD code populates with a lot of train inspectors start to know the codes, uh, the shape, and then all the, the colors that need RR or retroreflectivity, retroreflectivity values captured pop up as well. So it's a, it was a way for them to quickly figure out and confirm which type of sign they were looking at and then understand how many retroreflectivity values they actually had to collect for that particular sign. So that saved a lot of time in the field. I talked about the re retroreflectometer. It's tied in via Bluetooth. It not only collects the reflectivity values, but it's a barcode scanner. So as we got to each sign, we had pre-printed barcodes. Um, the user would scan the barcode. He would shoot the different re the required reflectivity values. Um, for this particular sign, you can see there's there's one background color which is actually kind of cut off, but you'll see that when I do the demonstration in the application, but there's two legend colors. There's a red and a white. So they would have to capture measurements for each one of those. And when they basically click for next sign, this information is sent to our application, and along with that comes a planning level GPS location. That really starts putting that support on the map for us and allowing us to position the associated roads and some other important spatial information. Um, that will eventually be updated when we up, update the coordinates um, after the, in the post-processing step. Support information is actually a separate uh, part of the application. Uh, the workflow essentially is the first thing they'll do is assess whether it's we can do a measured reflecti reflectivity assessment, which for the majority of cases we could. Um, they'll then go through and collect the sign attributes and then, of course, they'll need to actually collect the attributes about the support. And the way this works is the barcode, the support ID comes right from that barcode sticker that we scan in. Um, each sign has a barcode that ends with an A. The support is really just a number um, stripping A, B, C, or D off, which really corresponds to the number of signs that might be on the support. And then they'll go through and fill out the support information. And as you get to the bottom of this form here, you can see the, uh, the coordinates. And this is the information that auto-populated from the reflectometer. And the user can take it a step further, open the map, and do things like change the location. Move the location, because this location comes in, it may not have a great GPS uh, reading at the time it comes in. They can physically move it and say, hey, it's on this side of the road, it's by this part of the sidewalk. Again, knowing that it's going to be corrected later, but this is more for some of the other things they need to do, like assign, um, assign a route to that. They can click on a road. The um, route associated with that particular feature is assigned. They can measure the distance to intersection. Um, this was important for some of the county technicians who, or, or inspectors, or maintenance folks, if you will. Um, one of the attributes they use a lot is as they're driving up to a sign, they want to know how much further it is past the closest intersection. So if we, we, we collected a measure for, measurement for them, and that will kind of help them find that sign if they don't have any GPS units or they're just out there looking for a particular sign quickly. So this is all information that can be gathered in the map, and again, I'll show you this kind of live in, in a couple minutes here. And you can see here, what happens once you go through and select all the the intersections, associate the roads, um, measure the distance, it all comes back in and populates here. Uh, township auto-populates based on the municipal boundaries. Warrant and sign, I talked about this. These are the, these are the locations where there perhaps should be a sign, but there is none. What we do here is take the reflectometer and just, just fire it over the general location. And, we throw out the, reflect, the barcode and the reflectometer values and just bring in the location. And it's really the same workflow here. You can open up the map, you can move it, um, but there's definitely a stripped down amount of attributes that need to be uh, collected in this particular case. Missing signs uh, basically take you right to the support. If you're going to add a missing sign, you go right to the support screen. And what you're really saying here is I see a support and there's a sign missing on it. And then at this point, you're really just collecting information about a support 
um, so we can have it in a database and it can be queryable and a plan can be put in place if, if it's not needed immediately to address that issue. And I guess that's going to depend on the urgency and the nature of, of the sign that's missing and where it's located. Photos I talked about. Um, essentially, we built a file, watch, file watching component to this application. So if a, a field person is out inspecting or collecting attributes on a sign, and a photo is taken with the camera, and it's they're in the actual form, then the photo will auto-populate in this photos grid here. And um, they can edit the attributes and, and, and delete it or do whatever they need to do. And they can also, of course, add one manually if they need to at a later time. But the, the goal here was to, if you're in a specific, at a specific sign, you're doing the inventory, you're capturing photos, let's automatically link it to the, to the sign while we're, while we're standing there in the field. Um, so post-processing, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, linear referencing, we're eventually going to sign mileposts to each one of these sign supports based on the New Jersey Roadway Network. We are going to uh, build some scripts for QAQC, and then I talked about some of the degradation uh, tools that we're going to, or the degradation tool we're going to be able to help predict when a sign might fail uh, reflectivity. Quality assurance. Um, so... A couple things, and I think I might have touched on a lot of these already. Uh, we certainly had domains within a database to really limit the amount of data entry errors. I think majority of the, entr of the manual entry is for dimensions, um, offset from traveled way, or, or support heights, or, or things of that nature, or comments or text fields that are freeform. Uh, we have a lot of series of business rules enforced in the application. A lot, a lot of that re revolves around required fields that must be filled out to have a complete record and um, logic, logic along those lines. Uh, we did a small pilot project with um, the, field, the field crews to make sure it, the application supported the workflow, which really resulted in us changing where the support section was. I think at, at first we had the support section first, and kind of based on how they did things in the field, we decided to move it to where we did in the form, which is after a majority of the sign attributes are, are collected. Version editing, again, that was for the inventory portion of the project. And phase data delivery, um, I, I know they're working to get, we've been working to get the county data on a somewhat regular basis, so at least they see, have a sense for what's being collected, what's going on, and, and can raise any questions or concerns um, as we've been kind of walking through the project. Quality control, um, from an application perspective, uh, testing, we, we at JMT have our own dedicated testing team, so we certainly spend some time testing it before it's vetted in the field. From a data perspective, I know the field people, folks will be going back and revisiting any kind of questionable uh, data sets. We have the automated linear referencing, but at the same time, we're going to check out around the intersections, around the, uh, the on-ramps, the off-ramps, any, anywhere that uh, we know linear referencing can cause some some a little problematic. Well, I'm certainly going to review that data. And then we have the scripts to validate, which I, I've already talked about. Final deliverables will be a, an inventory database, a personal geo database. Um, in this particular case, we'll have the signs, the supports, the missing signs, the retroreflectivity, the warded locations, and some key attributes about those locations. Fo links to photos, and then the actual photos themselves, which will be in a separate directory. Recommendations uh, slash the degradation information, and then the actual application um, to allow easy maintenance of the data the way it's set up, set up now. And I have some key references here, um, which I think this eventually will be put on our website, so you'll be able to take a look at some of the references used to put this together. So, um, so this format's a little different. As I mentioned before, questions you can certainly enter them at any time in your GoToMeeting panel. Um, my contact info is there. I am going to switch now to showing a couple of the key workflows in the application. And um, once we're done there, I will go through and read through the questions. And then we'll just kind of have a Q the Q&A session will be at the end. Unfortunately, with not being able to hear everyone, it's going to be a little bit slow. But I'll just read through, give you my response, and we can follow up you know, after this GoToMeeting if needed. So let me, let me jump over to the application real quick. Um, make sure you guys can see this the way I'm seeing this. Okay. So here's the application. Again, it looks very familiar, uh, the screenshots. Um, I think the screenshots I showed everyone 
might not have had this degradation calculator in there, but this is something that we're working on now, and, and, and I kind of mentioned what that's going to be. But you have a home screen, typical home screen, where you can search based on certain parameters. You can search on the support. Um, you can search for signs collected yesterday, which looks like there was one for me testing the application out. Um, but the point is there's typical search parameters that uh, can be used to search not only the signs, the warranted locations, and then the supports themselves. So for every sign, there's at least one support. And in many cases, there's a, a one-to-many relationship between supports and signs. Your Bluetooth connectivity is up here. Uh, we're in test mode here because I don't want to send a location where I'm at now. It won't be anywhere on the Mercer County map. So we're in test mode, which uses a default location coordinate for, that, for the purpose of showing you how the application works. So let's jump in real quick here to the um, add sign workflow. So as I talked about, we have two field crews. Field crew gets the location, and they launch the add sign um, tool. So what happens here is, as I mentioned before, there are certain cases where a sign might be inaccessible. Again, this is not this is very few signs, but you can imagine on a, a, a freeway and overhead, there's no real way to get up there and measure that sign because to use that retroreflectometer, you have to get right up against that sign. In the field, we're using step ladders where the signs are, are relatively tall. So certain signs are just not safe or feasible to get at. And in that case, they would just check this button and they would group these all and at one night, a couple nights they go out and just do a quick nighttime uh, assessment of whether that sign passes or fails. Again, this is not a majority of signs, but it needs to be built in there because we did recognize that some of these signs would, uh, would need to go that way. Um, replacement year, again, that's a, a, a county field attribute. So if they determine they can do the retroreflectometer measurements, which was the majority of signs, the first thing they need to do was find the proper MUTCD, MUTCD code for the sign they're going to inventory. So let's just say it's something to do with a right turn. You can filter by keywords. And you're going to find the first one in our lookup table that has the word right turn in it. Well, you can certainly use your down arrow and, and bounce through each one of these and find the one that you need. And you can see here, as I'm doing this, the height and width are changing for each of these signs. So let's just say they decided, okay, this is the sign. It's got the height of 36, the width of 36, um, and this is what this is exactly what I'm looking at. So this was the first real key thing they needed to do when they got to the field. And then what this starts to tell them is we've identified the sign MUTCD code of R3-1, a background color of white that I need to collect, a legend color of black that I need to collect, and a ledger, legend color of red that I need to collect. So the, it basically requires three measurements using the reflectometer. So what they'll do at this point is they'll go and scan a barcode, which we have a, a sheet of stickers, and the barcode may read something, it'll be like six digits in a letter. So we'd scan that, that would be stored in the reflectometer. They would, they would shoot a, hold the reflectometer up to the white background, fire the device, a background value would be stored, background value would be stored. They'd hold the device up to the black legend, the arrow, a legend value would be stored, and then it would hit next sign and it would send this value to the application. So you can see here now that when I did when I fired that, the retro reflectometer values are now populated for the white background and a black legend. Again, this is all coming via Bluetooth via the device. And since there's an additional legend color, the red, they could check collect that basically locks in the other values and allows them to collect the value for the red separately and send that to the to the application and now you have your, your retro reflectometer device sent directly from that device into the application for this particular sign. As you, as you walk through this form you can see now the measurement date auto populates based on today which of course you can change. 
your sign ID, which came from that barcode, is now in here. Um, it is read-only. And then you go through and you fill different attributes about that particular sign, the travel direction, the position, compass direction. And I'm just really going through this quickly. So some of the data might not make any sense, but I just want to kind of work through it and, and show you how this works. Different material. These are county attributes, a condition. If there's any asset associated with the sign, uh, the status of the sign. And then you get to the support section. So if I tried to say this now, right, it's saying you have no support associated with this. You, you really can't save this record yet. So then I jump in and create the support that holds this particular sign. And what we do is we automatically strip the, the letter, the letter suffix at the end, which is basically indicating how many signs that support. So A is, A is sign number one with that support, B is sign number two with that support, and, and so on and so forth. We then populate the attributes that, about the particular position, um, the travel offset, speed limit, some other important stuff related to the type and the base. And then we get down to the location information. And as I kind of mentioned when I went through the slides, this comes in from the reflectometer device. And we can go in and fix that. We can come in, open the map. We see where the, the reflectometer threw our sign. And we, if we know that's not correct, we can certainly change the location and say, I think it's about right here. And that moves the particular sign where it needs to be. Another important attribute was, OK, well, what route is this sign associated with? So we can click on the map. And we get this particular support feature now associated with Nottingham Way, route number 614. If we want to sign a cross street, what's the cross street that's closest to that particular sign? We can cl click on the segment, and it will put that pr particular cross street there. If we want to measure the distance to the intersection, if you remember, this was the measurement that an individual that may not have a coordinate or may be passing a particular road wants to know how far the sign is past that intersection. We can find the intersection in the image, or sometimes it's part of the road segment, and just double click here, and we get a distance to the nearest inter uh, from, this, from this intersection to that particular sign. If we jump back out of the map, all this information is now going to be in there based on the interactive map. Enter the travel direction. Um, now, in a, in a practical world, you're, if you're looking for a sign distance to intersection, you're not going to use 327.47. You're going to use some kind of round number, but that's you know, we're calculating it all based on the information in the GIS. So we can save out of the support. We now have the support saved we can scroll down into the photo section. And to kind of simulate what may happen here, I've got the directory. Basically, you set up a path on your laptop where, as you're taking pictures, you want the application to look. So I'll simulate the camera going off, taking a picture of the sign. And once it drops into this directory here, you'll see it'll auto-populate in here. Hopefully, you saw that. Um, and basically, that simulates how it works in the field is when the inspector or the inventory person is taking a picture, we auto-populate the grid. We allow them to go in and edit the, any particular comments or description of the photo if they want. They can add a photo manually. Uh, we'll add that one. And then save it once they're done with the record. So I'm basically saying here that I have an attribute that's not completed, which is sign description. Oh, right here. So I can click NA, NA there. So that was a QA in pro working in, pro in, in working real time there, basically telling me I had missed an, an important field that we need to either identify there's no description needed or, or put some, some language in there to describe the sign. So now we have this sign support and sign record uh, captured in the database. And you can see here, here's the stuff that I 
I just added from the application. You can go just view it in the map if you'd like, or you can you can edit it. Um, going back to the same form and just work off that same form and do the editing. Um, just one other work for real quick, uh, and then we can jump in any questions you may have. I don't have a lot more to show, I think, after this. The warranted sign, I talked about this before in, in the presentation. Um, we're just using the, the, the GPS in the reflectometer, really just standing over where we think the sign needs to be and then firing the device, and it discards the the barcode reader and the reflectometer measurements. Based on location, it throws in the township, and, and just like before, you can go in the map and you can move it to wherever you think that location should be. And do all the the mapping, important mapping things such as assigning a route, anything that needs to be done. Add a description. Add a photo if you'd like, save it, and now you've got your your warranted your warranted uh, warranted location and all the information about that particular location. So I think I think that's a pretty good overview of what it was. Again, it was a simple application uh, designed for a very specific purpose to aid in the collection. Um, it, we knew it was going to be a, a, a on foot collection because of some of the attributes and the barcode stickers. So it was really customized to aid in the collection and also to help manage the data afterwards uh, when simple modifications need to be to made to the actual to the database. So with that in mind, I will look through if we have any questions here I need to, to talk through. And it looks like we have a couple. So one question was, how does Mercer County intend to maintain inventory? Do they plan to use the JMT tools and conduct periodic field checks? So um, part of it is they're going to, um, once we hand over the, the inventory, they're, they're going to use our tools to, to do some updating to the data. Um, but I also know that they have some systems that they're working on that eventually the data might go into. Um, actually, Janelle is from Mercer County. I don't know, Janelle, if you have any color you may want to add to that um, to that particular question. Um, yeah, uh, just to, to clarify, you, you said it mostly. Um, we uh, we're training our traffic and sign people to keep the inventory current. Basically, every time new signs come in, they get a barcode, and um, they're tracked through our maintenance um, log where they're getting replaced or pulled from so um, that the barcode the, the the number on it is 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 part of our entire maintenance tracking system and we're working to roll that into a larger asset management database so it's a constant ongoing main maintenance of the inventory good Okay, um, and I think we have one other one here, Janelle, um, which I think I can handle here. Can this process be used on Explore tablets? Uh, so basically, this is this is a Windows-based application. Um, Explore tablet. I'm trying to, if if that is Windows-based, it, it it should be able to work on that on that on that tablet. I'm not as familiar with Explore tablets as I am with some of the other ones. Uh, I, I maybe they mean Geo Explorer, so the Trimble it's, Geo Explorers. It's Explore tablets, X P L R O E tablet. Oh. oh, we actually have a couple more that just came in too. So, so how long did it take to collect and record data at a, at a simple sign installation? Okay, I think this is how long did it take to collect per sign. And by, I think we originally thought it would be about 15 to 20 minutes, and I think by the time we got through this project and, and the, the folks got used to the process and the workflow, 
I believe we were right around 10 to 15 minutes per signing. It really depends on you know how many values you might need to collect per sign in terms of reflectivity. Um, but I think that's kind of where we were by the, by the time it ended. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the more that you use it, the faster that they were getting, basically, once they got used to it. Right. Um, this might be one for you, Janelle. How do you determine the replacement cycle for signs? Um, well, we, we, as you all might know, that there is there needs to be a maintenance plan involved to start with, and our maintenance plan basically says that every time that we um, rehabilitate a road or uh, so mill and pave, we also look at all the associated assets that go with that road. So basically our replacement cycle for signs is led by our rehabilitation projects. Uh, so um, as Bob pointed out, we're also doing an analysis of the degradation of the signs that are already out there. Uh, so based on the, the two things, whether we're paving a road and therefore we're going to look at all the signs that are associated with that road and replace those that are needed, and also going through this entire inventory that is just about being done and seeing which ones are um, well, that need to be replaced now, and which ones will need to be replaced next year and the year after. So it's uh, not very complicated, but it basically starts with our paving uh, program. Okay. How much of the field inventory has been completed to date? Um, I think we're pretty much done with uh, the the data collection are close to done, right, Janelle? Yeah. I think there's a month or two months left in the um, inventory. But okay. yeah, we're, we're nearing completion, um, well over 10,000 signs. And this is one that you may or may not be able to answer. How, how do you determine the cost for maintaining the signs? Um, we uh, we have to relook at this after the inventory, but right now we do have a calculation based on uh, the cost and time involved in the whole project of both rehabilitating the road and replacing the signs and looking at the other assets like guide rails and um, striping and so forth. So it's it's a percentage of the entire project right now. But we hope to fine tune that once the inventory is in and we're uh, working directly with that. You can call, you can email me and I can talk to you further about it. Yeah. Uh, this is one I, I can certainly handle. Um, the cost of the reflectometer, it's about a $10,000 device. I remember when we were looking around for um, the best tool uh, that was really the best option for what we were doing. Uh, uh, just, there is uh, one available through the local the TAP center, the LTAP, uh, that can be borrowed for months at a time if you're doing it on your own. Um, so they do have a retro reflectometer and training available through the LTAP center. Yep. And it looks like the last one so far. What was the expected project timeline for field collection? How many months did it take to collect all the signs? It was like November we started, correct, Janelle? Yeah, um, that sounds about right. We, um, yeah, so we're going to be done. It's about a year. Mm -hmm. I guess it's taken a little bit less than a year, but yeah, a year. Yeah, and more keep coming in. How far from the county is intersection are the municipal signs collected? Oh, um, on on the on the county routes, um, there every single one of them is collected. I think they're asking about five streets. Yes, they are. So that's correct. Inter, yeah, intersections 
any roads that intersect a county maintained road are um, there are signs looked for for I think it was 600 feet. I think that's yeah, that sounds right. The amount right. So um, any anything that is involved with traffic flow onto our county roads, the the signs on the side streets are collected, which was the important one of the important steps that we needed to go through um, in collecting was to get all the side street signs. Um, and another question, how did you handle the temperature tolerances for the reflectometer during the winter months? Um, I know I was out there on a couple cold days. Uh, I, they weren't the coldest days because I'd have to say on the coldest days they probably weren't collecting data. Um, it, it worked okay when it was out in the 30 degrees, but I think there were some, certainly some days where they just didn't collect data with the reflectometer. Yeah, we, we had a very cold winter, yes. a very snowy winter, so um, I think the collection slowed down during yes. that time. There were just some days that was possible. Yeah, I think the month of February was really, really difficult. I mean, as, as everyone probably is well aware, and anyone collecting data probably had some trouble during those months. Um, just some more uh, on the explore question. Um, Lori Bowman has sent quick note, they appear to be Android tablets, so this would, would not work on an Android tablet. This is not a web-based application. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's a Windows desktop application. So a tough book would work. As Correct. A like tough book, but not an Explorer. Correct. All right. Um, another one came in here. Are private developments required to inventory signs? Not for this particular inventory. I, I, I guess that would only, no, I, I mean, I don't, it could be uh, used by them, but it was not the intent for uh, county maintained signs. Right. Okay. Well, I think, everyone, I have read through all the questions. Um, certainly, I, myself, or Janelle are available to answer anything else that might come up. I believe if you have responded to the or signed up for the webinar, you should have the ability to contact one of us and we'll, we'll get your questions answered if, if, uh, if of course, we're able to. Um, but I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, I think we're going to come in just under an hour. And um, I have recorded this, so hopefully we can, we can put it up uh, on the website at some point in the near future and, and let everyone know. But again, thank you everyone for your, for your time and uh, Enjoy the rest of your day.